December 10th will be our first official service in our new home. So we thought it'd be a great opportunity today to, to, to record the message and send it to you. And, and we're praying for that. Uh, you guys are meeting in homes and gathering and And uh, we really are. We're very thankful for this opportunity to gather with friends and family as we watch this message. And and if I can start it off in prayer, and then we're actually going to take a break from our Gospel of Mark series. Uh, We're halfway through, and we'll start that at the beginning of the new year. But I've got the the Holy Spirit put a what I feel is a a wonderful Advent message for the next four weeks leading up to, to Christmas Day. So if we can go to prayer, and Lord, Father, we thank you. Lord, we're so, so grateful for the body of believers that you brought together. Lord, we, we, we welcome the Holy Spirit through all mediums, in person and corporate, through social media, as, we, as we're in our homes with our family and friends. And Lord, we pray for the message that there's, there's hearts that are soft uh, to receive and, and ears that are willing to hear. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it... We're going to take a break. We've been through the Gospel of Mark. We've been walking through the books of the Bible as we do, and and I think we're on week seventeen. and And the Lord really started putting on my heart this this Advent message for the next four weeks. And um, so we're going to take a break from Mark. We'll start back at the beginning of the new year. And and it's really an interesting as the Holy Spirit began to speak about the different characters in the Christmas story, and some of the folks that that maybe have not gotten. Um, the attention I think that they probably believe they deserve, and they do. And it's really some fascinating stories. So I want to share that, the stories of different couples and different people over the next four weeks as we we lead to our our Christmas service. So um, we're actually, we're recording this, obviously. And and, uh, like Lee and I, we've sent you a couple emails and text messages and and really hopeful that you've gotten together with friends and family and and are maybe enjoying a brunch and and of course the the link's going to be posted for for good so anytime you go to to watch it or rewatch it uh, we'll be thankful for it but remember it's a four week series so this is the first week and it's going to lead into the next three so I want to share with you the one thing that the that the Holy Spirit has put on my heart for this week and to share this message is that the birth of Jesus is always good news regardless of whatever you whatever season you find yourself the gospel message is always the good news message and the birth of Christ is what what brought the physical manifestation of, of God incarnate uh, and that's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we're walking through this four-part series in what we in Advent, which is a four-week celebration in preparation and anticipation of the birth of Jesus Christ. And you know, we always want to encourage is is where there's Jesus, there's hope. So sometimes I know the holiday seasons get stressful, and and whatever the dynamics, the social dynamics. Uh, but I just want to continue to encourage you that where there's Jesus, there's hope. And that's the, that's the theme of today's message, uh, is hope. So I'm going to read the anchor scripture, and it actually comes from Luke. It's 1, 11 through 15. So I'll read this, and, and if I'm sure you have your Bibles, and let's read together. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. This is this is the angel Gabriel, and he is he is giving the message, the prophetic word uh, that Jesus, uh, John the Baptist is going to be, uh, is going to become their son. It is a miraculous occurrence. And, and that's where the hope of Jesus Christ comes from. So let's start off as we do. We want to walk through, uh, through this scripture and, and we'll start off from Luke 1, 5. And, and I'll read this. It's uh, John's birth announced to Zacharias. It said, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughters of Aaron, 
and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. What I'd like to do is I would like to look at the what we call the characters of Christmas. And sometimes these are characters that might otherwise be left out. You know, Elizabeth and Zacharias are one of the three true power couples, married couples in the New Testament. Of course, the other two would be uh, Mary and Joseph and Aquila and Priscilla. And we're looking at the, at the, the marriage, the love, the hope, the promise fulfilled of, of Elizabeth and Zacharias. I believe there's really a special message in here as we prepare for anticipation of, of the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, often, uh, as Lee and I are parents, and, and oftentimes parents are overshadowed by their kids. And as parents, we love it. We want to push our kids up front. We cheer for them. We support them. And, you know, this is the same thing with, with Elizabeth and Zacharias. I mean, they will, will become the parents of John, John the Baptist. So when, uh, when Jesus in Matthew 11, 11 says, I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Like, that's a hard act to follow. And as parents, can you imagine the joy that Elizabeth and Zacharias felt knowing that, that they were completely overshadowed by their son John the Baptist? Overshadowed because John had been prophesied. John was a promise from the Lord. And John did the work of the Lord. So what I want to focus on is on Elizabeth and Zacharias. You know, this couple, it says that they were righteous and they were blameless. Now, that's pretty high praise as well. But you know, for Elizabeth and Zacharias, they both came from the line of Levi. And if you remember, um, the tribe of Levi, that began with Aaron, who was Moses' brother, and the Levites became the temple priest. So both Zacharias and Elizabeth were from the line of Levi. Now that's, that's, that's an honor, but that's a lot of pressure. And especially the way that you keep the lineage going is that through your children, through a male son, a male child, uh, then they would become a temple priest, and then that's the way the lineage has continued. Despite Zacharias and Elizabeth being righteous before the Lord and blameless, they were, they were barren. They were old age, and they were well, she was well past the, the childbearing age, and she was barren. And if you're familiar with the, with the culture of the time, uh, a woman who without children, who's barren, uh, the culture looked at her, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a shame culture. Uh, they looked at you as maybe you were in some sin, or there was something of defect in your life or your physical body. So here's Elizabeth who is righteous and blameless before the Lord, and she's barren. You know, unfortunately, I mean, as, as committed as they were to the Lord, they carried the pressure and the burden of all these generations, from Aaron to, to Levi, through, the, through all the generations of the Levitical priests. Like, would this line end with Zacharias and Elizabeth? I mean, that's a lot of pressure, the cultural shame. And we know that Elizabeth felt shame because in verse 25, she talks about the shame. It says, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. That reproach is to be judged, to be condemned, to be put to shame. Like this sister came from the, from the lineage of, of the priesthood. This sister and her husband were committed. They were faithful. They were a power couple in the New Testament, yet they're barren. And, and so the culture was looking down upon them. But you know, a lot of times we find ourselves in these complex situations. You know, how often, I can imagine that the people saying, well, well how can you be blessed and barren? I mean, that's the way the world likes to approach us. You know, other things, well, if God loved you, uh, then why didn't he heal you? And, and it's just the way the, the culture, and I don't want to say just the unbelieving culture, because, you know, honestly, we, we all get that a lot amongst Christians, where they don't understand, you know. Um, 
You know, we said, well, if God loved you, then why did, he, why did he let you lose your marriage? Or why did he let you lose your money? Or why did he let you lose your mind? I mean, the world will come at you with anything that the devil will give them to throw at you. And unfortunately, a lot of times those attacks come through the church, come through believers. You know, um, a lot of times what, it's not just external attacks. Often it's, it's believers who are struggling with their faith. If you remember the Greek word um, for, for wind, uh, anemos. And if you recall, as we, we walk through the Gospel of Mark, when the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, going to the region of the Gadarenes, and they encountered the wind. If you remember, it wasn't the, the, the waves. The wind was the source. The waves were just the symptom. Uh, it's, it, the Greek word, anemos, for wind, is, is shifting doctrine. So a lot of times when we get these reproaches amongst people and amongst believers, where they start to question, well, well, if God really loved you, then how come this? Or if God would bless you, why are you barren? A lot of times it's people that are trying to, trying to justify the shifting of doctrine. And hopefully that they're coming into an understanding of the right understanding of the word of the Lord. But I want to tell you that that whether they're struggling or you're struggling, or it's just an external attack from, from a demonic, unbelieving world, there's always hope in Jesus Christ. You know, as an example, and it's a common example, but you know, how many times do, do we feel condemned by culture? You know, where we've had our own complex situation. Maybe it's not an issue of, of being barren. But maybe through divorce or bankruptcy or, or your age, you're too young, you're too old. Um, maybe, maybe you have a prodigal child or you are a prodigal child. Uh, you know, it could be anything from a employment to addiction. And the world is going to use that. to, Well, if God's a loving God, then how come you're unemployed? And that's where you've got to understand. You've got to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil by putting on the whole, a whole armor of God because that's where your hope comes from. This is what Elizabeth and Zacharias do. They find their faith, their hope, anchored in the word of the Lord. I wanna, what I want to encourage you is when the world attacks you with these things, like they did Elizabeth and like they did Zacharias, I mean, just thinking about the the pressure the culture is putting on these two people. They are good people. They've not done anything wrong. She has just not been able to bear a child, and they're into their old age. So here's the, here's the culture. They always want to find that thread. But I want to encourage you that if you've ever been felt like you've been disqualified for serving the Lord, only the Lord can qualify you. You're not there to satisfy the public or win opinion or approval of man. It is always only what the Lord has to say. And you know, when we, I want to share the example of, of, so here's Elizabeth and Zechariah. He's a priest. He's a temple priest. They come from the royal lineage of priests, of high priests from the tribe of Levi. They are Levi he is a Levitical temple priest. And, and it is his turn to actually go into the, the inner temple to, to minister. And they're getting these attacks. I can almost hear the, the people like, really? You got chosen to go into the temple? Like, seriously? You don't even have a child. Like, come on, Zacharias. You know, the lineage is going to end because you and your wife can't have a child. I can just hear the naysayers. And look, if we're honest, we've all got them in our lives. But you know what Elizabeth and Zacharias did? They continued serving the Lord. They continued standing in faith as a couple they continue to support one another. And they continue trusting in the Lord for his promise, not for their preference. I want to assure you, whatever the Lord has promised you, whatever the Lord has spoken to and over you, those words remain in effect. Like God's word does not expire. I want to encourage you to, to stand in faith I guess hold God to the promises that he made for you. And can you do that? Yes, you can. I want to reference King David in 1 Chronicles uh, 17, 23, and I'll read it. And now, O Lord, I am your servant. Do as you have promised concerning me and my family. May it be a promise that will last forever. What I want to tell you is the hope comes from the from the eternity of God's word. 
If God said it, God will do it. God needs you to partner with him and stand in faith for that word. So let's move on. Let's go down to Luke uh, 111. And I'll read. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call him John. I want you to think about this. Let's put this in cultural context. Like it's been 400 years since anybody has heard from the Lord. If you recall, the the last book in the Old Testament, which is also the last chronological book in the Old Testament, is what? You're right, it's Malachi. 400 years had passed since anyone had heard a word from the Lord. So here's Zacharias, an old man. He and his wife have been faithful and good stewards for all these years. And they're looking at the burden and the pressure of the lineage of the Levitical priests and their family coming to an end with them. Because she was barren. So he, he, what this says, they cast a lot. At the time, there was about 18,000 Levitical temple priests. They ministered in the temple 24-7. Uh, they took shifts. And, and so when they cast lots, it was basically throwing dice by random, random selection. So Zacharias would have, with that many, with that many different priests, he would have gotten to go into the, the temple by himself to minister to the, at the altar about twice a year. So this was a big deal. So his number comes up. Zacharias is like, good, this is wonderful. Despite what the culture is saying and the allegations and the, and the innuendos about it not having any kids and the lineage dying off with them, he was there to do the work of the Lord. You see, Zacharias was there to serve God not serve public, not serve opinion, and not serve himself. So think about this. It's been 400 years, and no one has heard a peep from the Lord. So it's Zacharias' time to go to church. And I would probably venture that he's like, well, it's going to be the same old, same old, but I'm going to do my duty, and I'm going to show up. And he walks into the temple, and bam! There stands Gabriel. I mean, can you imagine? You're expecting the same old, same old? I don't know, maybe, maybe they, after 400 years, even the, the entire nation of Israel, maybe they all just had kind of given up. They no longer had an expectation for the, for the encounter of the supernatural. You know, I want to encourage you that if you've not heard from the Lord in a while, I want, to, I want to encourage you to always have an expectation of a supernatural encounter with the living God. And the reason that, that I can empower you to do this is because if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. One third of you, spirit, soul, body, one third of you is the perfect 100% righteousness of God, the Holy Spirit. So you are a supernatural being because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So Zacharias walks into the temple to do his duty, hadn't heard anything from the Lord in 400 years, and there stands the angel Gabriel. And it says that he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Like, can you imagine? Can you imagine how amazing that had to be? The next thing, the way he tells him, do not be afraid, which is a common phrase that he shared with, with folks every time he appeared. And he says, he reads, he says, your prayer is heard. What I want to assure you is God hears your prayers. Sometimes we feel like, oh, we're just wasting our time. Your prayers are heard and they maintain. Actually, Revelations 5.8, Revelation 5.8 tells us that our prayers are actually held in golden bowls in heaven, and that they'll be poured out at the right time. Your prayers 
are not just some wish lists that are floating in the sky. Now, if you're offering your prayer and petition as a wish list, treating God like a sugar daddy or a genie in a bottle, then you're, those aren't prayers. Those are not righteous prayers. But if you were praying, and you were praying the, the will of the Lord, because the God, when you're praying, God's giving you desires of your heart, that is God's will. Your prayers have the gravity of the love of in the eternal promise of God. So as Zacharias, through all these years, he is continuing to pray and to pray and to pray, even when it seems like, you know what, we're not going to get a son. You know what, this line, this lineage, after all these generations, may just die with us. It would be easy to give up hope, maybe even turn, turn negative against Elizabeth. It's like, well, you're the one that's barren. You're holding me back. But you know what You know what Zacharias does? He focuses on the Lord. He focuses on serving God. And he continues to pray, pray faithfully. And boom, here is the angel Gabriel. And what does he tell him? Your prayer has been heard. My goodness, that is so powerful. What I want to tell you, it actually the word Zacharias in Hebrew, it means God remembers. All those years of Zacharias praying, and God heard them, he keeps them in a golden bowl in heaven, and he never forgets. And you know what I really think is so beautiful? Is here's Zacharias, an older guy, and you know, I'm an, I'm an older man, and sometimes I'm praying for, Lord, I hope my back doesn't hurt, or my knees don't give out going down the stairs, and this brother had prayed without ceasing for his wife to bear a child. So when, when, the, when angel Gabriel meets him in the temple and he says, your prayer, singular, your prayer has been heard. If Gabriel showed up in your life and said, your prayer has been heard, we don't have to raise a hand. How many would have a bass boat sitting out in the driveway or a new car? Or be on their way to vacation. This brother's prayer was for what? Was for his wife. Was for his wife to bear a son. I mean, she had well passed the childbearing age. But Zacharias never relented from the faithful prayers because of the promise of God. His one prayer was for his wife. And here's the angel after 400 years of silence to reassure this brother that your prayer has been heard. And Gabriel tells him, for he, talking about John, their son, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. I will tell you that there's a partnership in the reception of God's blessings. God declares that John will be great in his sight. That's God's declaration. The reciprocating action of faith and obedience is, but John must do his part. You see, too often, and this is an equipping moment, we want the calling without the character. We want the supernatural without the sacrifice. We want the oil without the effort. See, God wants to bless you. We've all been called. There's a calling on all of our lives. And whether you receive Jesus today or you reject, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess because there is a calling on your life. God has oil to anoint you, to give you gifts of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to develop the character to carry that anointing. And this is what, this is what the angel is telling Zacharias. Like John will be great in the sight of the Lord, but John shall not drink wine or alcoholic drinks. And whatever the condition that the Lord laid, it's an issue of obedience. And you know, we share, sometimes when, you, when you're obedient to the Lord, like you don't get anything for being obedient, except for being obedient. So we move on, and we go to, uh, we're in Luke 1, 16, and I'll read. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, 
He's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, in the spirit uh, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What I want to reference this, I, I mentioned Zachar, um, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, is when, Jesus, uh, when God, the Lord, said, I'm out. I got out. And it had been 400 years. See, God's plans are always anchored to Scripture. So when, when the Lord, when the, I'm sorry, Angel Gabriel is talking to Zacharias and he's prophesying about his son John, who he is, what he will be, what his mission is, he's coming in spirit and power of Elijah. This is not just an original thought from, from a powerful angel. An angel is a messenger of the Lord. He's confined to the word of the Lord. And that word of the Lord comes from Scripture. So where does what uh, Gabriel tells Zacharias come from? Well, it comes from Malachi. And I'll read. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the father to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. What I want to share with you is a lot of times I'll get the question. It's like, well, how do I know if it's God talking to me or the devil or the world or my own imagination? Well, the first standard is, is that word anchored in Scripture? If it's, if it's extra biblical or it's, or it's not even attached to any scriptural reference, then it's not from the Lord. God's word is God's word and God's word is reflected in the Bible. So that's a standard. So when, when even, even Zacharias, I mean, look, seriously, this brother had to be a little freaked out. It said he was, he, he was fearful. It fell upon him. And you're talking to the angel Gabriel. And even if he doubted, and we're going to see in a second that he does doubt. But how do you check the doubt? Is it anchored in scripture? Is it consistent with the word of the Lord? So let's continue into Luke 1.18. And it says, and Zacharias said to the angel, this is where the doubt comes in. How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my, well, my wife is well advanced in years. A lot of times we want to get like hashtag over religious. It's like, come on, Zacharias. Like this is Gabriel. How could you, how could you doubt? And I want, to, I want to just ask you, like, just kind of slow your roll sometimes. Because how many times when the Lord's given us a word, do we start interjecting our own limitations based on our natural understanding. And we, we kind of discount, dispel, and disregard the supernatural nature of God's promises. I mean, so many times I hear, well, I'm too young, or I'm too old, or I'm too poor, or I'm too new at the faith. When God's telling you, this is my prophetic word for you. This is my promise for you. And instead of receiving it and becoming a good steward of it, and then reciprocating with that promise, where God says, I will, I will use you to change nations. Amen, Lord. And a lot of times we, we pray, God, use me. What we need to start praying is, God, make me use a bowl. Make me use a bowl. So when I receive the word, the prophetic word from the Lord, my first default is not in the natural understanding. It's usable where we have the faith to say, Lord, I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm there with you. I don't know where we're going but I'm going to follow. You see, that I think is such a, is such a shift. A lot of times, like, Lord, use me, use me. You don't even know if you're, you're usable. You don't pour water into a pitcher if there's a giant hole in the bottom. This is where it's really important to, to connect with the Holy Spirit and ask him to seek and search your, your soul and, and, and make sure that you are a vessel with the character to carry the calling and the anointing of the Lord. So we'll continue walking through. We're at Luke 119. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Because you did not believe. You didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. What I want to tell you, I want to remind you, Elizabeth and Zacharias were from the lineage of the Levites. 
the temple priests, the Levitical priests, they, in, in the beginning, it says they were blameless and righteous before the Lord. These are good people. Listen, these are good people, all right? And yet this brother, when he met face to face with the angel Gabriel, he doubted. He doubted. I'll tell you, he's not the first when there's, when there's news of, of a child in old age. If you remember Abram, who became Abraham, and Sarai, Sarah, when, when, the, when, the, when the Lord told him that she was going to have a child, what did Sarah do? Sarah laughed. It didn't mean that the Lord took the promise away from her. Just understanding there's a little bit of doubt. I understand it, but let's go forward with the promise. Zacharias did the same thing. He's like, we're old. How's that going to work? He's thinking in the natural. He's not understanding God's promise in the supernatural. And you know when it says that, that, um, that he was mute, like in the Greek, like he could not even an utterance of sound. He couldn't grunt. He could do nothing. And what I want to tell you, it was not for punishment. It was for protection. You see, often God's calling on your life is not a conference call. It's meant for you. And a lot of times the best thing you can do when you're receiving words from the Lord is be quiet. What we want to do is we're not going to believe the word from the Lord. So we're going to run it by 10 or 20 or maybe 150 people on Facebook. We want to see what they got to say. So the best way that the Lord could protect the promise that he gave to, to Zacharias and, and Elizabeth was to, to seal his mouth shut so he could no longer speak doubt or worry. And like I said, it was, it was actually, it was not punishment, it was protection. So I want to encourage you as the Lord speaks to you. And, and maybe you're not sure if it's the Lord or not. And like I said, the first test, the first standard, is it grounded in Scripture? If it is, and there's, it's a word from the Lord, do not feel compelled to tell everybody. That's when the static of the, of the world uh, really gets in and starts to distort that message. So we go to Luke one twenty four. Now, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach amongst people. Her reproach, her shame, came in her barrenness. The Lord had blessed her with the child. The Lord had taken away that reproach. And what I want to share with you, we talked about them being the one of three power couples in the New Testament, along with uh, Aquila and Priscilla and Joseph and Mary. Uh, but this was really a solid Christian-loving couple. And in this time... So we know that Zacharias was faithfully praying for his wife. If you remember, Gabriel said, your prayer, singular, has been answered. You, your wife will have a son. And so he was always taking care of her. Now he's been stricken for, say, whatever the period of time, nine months. And here's um, Elizabeth now taking care of him. They didn't know why he was silent. He couldn't even communicate that. But she was so loving, so faithful, so good that she remained close and intimate with him. How do we know that they were intimate? Well, she became pregnant. So they would have the son. And God didn't just give her a son. God gave her the restoration of hope. And that's the beauty of the promise of God. And I want to share, a, I get a question. So it's like, why did she hide herself for five months? Well, I'm going to tell you, it was not Jewish custom. There was nothing about hiding yourself away. And, and maybe there were some practical elements. I mean, she's an old lady and, you know, I just want to be sure. And, you know, we'll hold off on the baby shower. And we're maybe not going to do a, a gender reveal right now and stuff. But, but what I believe is that they loved the Lord so much. They revered the word. They feared the word of the Lord so much. That, that the angel Gabriel in, in one, uh, Luke 1, 14 says, And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice when? At his birth. It doesn't say at the pregnancy, at the baby shower, at his one-year-old party, when you cut his curly hair at the age of two. You will rejoice at his birth. She being obedient as she is, in that obedience, the Lord blessed her with this child so they would continue the lineage of the Levitical priests. I believe that's why she hid herself in humility and honor and in reverence of the Lord. 
So what I want to share with you is that we start to wrap up. Is that where there's God, there's hope. No matter how much time has passed between the promise of God, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter how many wrong turns or backtracks, if you've taken A to Z to get to C, the word of the Lord endures forever. There was always hope where there's Jesus Christ. And you know what I think is really, really beautiful? So here's this faithful couple, loving, intimate, praying for one another, and they carried the burden and the shame of, of a culture that shamed her, reproached her because she was barren. So they had to have worried at times, are we going to be the end of the lineage of the Levitical priesthood? Had God not blessed them with John in the natural, yes, they would have been. But the beauty of it is, do you realize that John the Baptist was to become the very last high priest of the Old Covenant? When he baptized and announced the way for Jesus, Jesus became the high priest in the New Covenant. So what they thought was actually a, an, an old ending was actually the birth to a new beginning. So I want to just encourage you to cling to it, no matter what's going on in life during this holiday season that where there's Jesus there's hope so I thank you for this for this time that I was able to spend with you I wish we could have been in the new church home today but you know what the Lord has assigned December 10th for our first service and as we gather together on December 10th in our new home we'll all like oh okay this is why. This is why. But for today, Lee and I, we do. We pray that you're together with family and, and other members of the church. And, and I do. I want to I pray a prayer as we pray ourselves out. And, and just tell you that, that in this season of Advent for the next four weeks, um, I believe it's going to be a, um, a very fun uh, four-week series. And as we continue to build the excitement up to the celebration of the coming of Jesus Christ. So if I can pray for you, and, and then we cannot wait to see you next Sunday. And we're also going to be moving in and packing and unpacking throughout the week, so we really expect to see you there. So, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for the goodness of your word, the eternity of your promise. Lord, we thank you that all your words of correction, conviction, prophecy, direction, Everything is grounded in the eternal, true, honest word of the Lord. Father, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.